Good morning, friends. Uh, it's Friday, our uh, second day of adventure, and uh, it is raining outside. Ta da! Uh, raining, and the temperature is a little cold. So I don't know how that works with mushrooms. I will check out uh, spots in lower elevation to see whether we can spot some uh, kind of poking out of the ground, uh, beginning to grow. I'm sure it's gonna take a little bit of time, right? Um, and then if that's not gonna work today, then we're gonna have to do some other fun stuff. Uh, I wonder what that's gonna be. There is so much to do uh, now. Um, oh, I just want to show you around. I made my bed already, but look at the rain and the clouds and the snow outside. It's so magical. All right. Okay, we're ready to go. Well, I found a really cool forest a part where there is a tiny trail. So I think I'm gonna head back that way to see for some mushrooms. And I like that uh, this part of the forest has pine trees and not just deciduous trees. And of course there is trash as always. I can't believe this. Such beautiful places are full of you know, not full of, but still, people manage to do this. So, we're gonna clean up the trash and head uh, onto a little hike to see what's going on in the forest. Are there any mushrooms at all or not? Are there uh, stumps? No, stumps. What do they call them? The mushrooms that are about to come out from underneath uh, the ground. Shrimps. Yeah, let's see if they have any shrubs here today. Uh, no mushrooms here on this path. So we're gonna keep moving forward and forward is down. That means the elevation will be uh, decreasing and maybe we will have better luck finding mushrooms there. Uh, the other part uh, about it is that the last two days were dry. So I don't know how this works. I don't know 
if the mushrooms would grow this fast, right? Uh, the rain has, begun, has started six hours ago. Maybe we have to give it a little more time, but I'm gonna give it a shot at the lower elevation just in case. And then if there is no sign of mushrooms, which are here, I've seen them um, in the fall of last year, 2023, then if they're not here at all, um, then we're gonna go and do something else, right? Everything is fun. Okay, we're gonna um, head down. Bye. Guys, I pulled over uh, just off the road because I saw this piece of dead tree, a couple more there, and I decided, you know what? Why not check uh, here? And look what I found. This is such a treat. Uh, these cones. Um, they are usually and trash of course we're gonna pick up trash these cones are usually super duper high up in the tree and I'm so lucky to find them on the ground these long ones oh my god I feel like taking one with me oh, there's a little spidey it's probably his home he's hiding under there so I'm not gonna take them but let's take a good mental image and a picture so we can identify them later I believe these are the ones that are sitting all the way at the top usually I looked them up on Google and they seem to be from a sugar pine hallelujah we found the mushroom look it was kind of hard to find I oh I, I went in on the on the trail didn't find anything was coming back to the car and BAM here it is uh, let's see what it is firstly I found it by this stump and ta -da 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 -da. look at these guys oh my god they're popping out everywhere there are more over there you see that's a shrub I found my first shrub I'm gonna cry oh my gosh what are these guys who are these guys i'm so looking forward to getting to know them you see i went down uh elevation just a tad and right away the earth must have been a little bit warmer here for the last two days and then well or maybe a couple of weeks and uh we got these little beauties all right well I am going to collect this one for identification. Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. I'm gonna wiggle. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna wiggle, 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 wiggle. Trying to get as much of the mushroom with me as possible. All right. Look at this guy. Oh, wow. gorgeous oh we're gonna identify you to the, tonight oh I feel like I need a basket now wow all right and there are the little ones look they're growing right there that's a shrub and one more this one looks like somebody got to them already and then there is this little guy right there well, one is enough for me for identification. I think we got it with, uh, I think we got it with everything we need, right? And doesn't seem like there is um, any damage as far as uh, the insects go. So I will take this one. Yay! Look at the gills and the cap and I don't see uh, the ring from the veil or maybe it's right here let's smell it too oh ooh, I wish I knew how to describe smells this smells nice <laughs> you know I actually did finish a sommelier school society school and um, I should be very good with description of the smells this is just earthy maybe a little bit peppery peppery notes oh I am so happy I found mushroom finally and 
we're gonna get to identify with you together. Our learning process has begun. It's official. A little cool trick that I do um, for uh, identification of plants and uh, now mushrooms, right? Uh, I utilize the technology that we have. Uh, so instead of using um, a pen and paper, uh, because during the rain, guess what? It's probably gonna get soaked. Although I know yellow Eleanor said that she has this pad that uh, is specifically for uh, rain weather and uh, it stays dry. Uh, it's designed to be that way. Now, uh, what I do is um, I take a picture of a plant or a mash mushroom and then whatever useful information that I want to store with that image, I go to edit and then on top I go to um, mark up uh, option. So. For the markup option, you can type in whatever you want on that image. And I usually type in um, uh, the date. Uh, and like for the mushroom right now, I typed in uh, the location. So I went onto Google Maps. I dropped a pin for where I am and I copied uh, all the information, the name of the road and uh, elevation or hold on. Uh, not just elevation, there is no elevation there, although I'm sure I can figure it out somehow. Uh, what I did is I um, uh, copied also longitude and latitude, right? So I have that, the GPS coordinates, yes, I remember the name. Uh, so I have that right on the image of the mushroom because Later on, as I find more, it's gonna start getting very confusing. I've done that before and then oh, everything got messed up. And I was like, I will remember this one. I will remember where I found this one. This one, this purple one is from here. And then this red one is from here. And of course, when I got home, I was like, I have no clue. So uh, try to identify um, your mushrooms right away. As much information as you can, write it in and then um, uh, it'll be easier to identify when you have many of them. All right. Well, that's just my personal experience so far. And I'm not a pro. I'm a total beginner. Total beginner. All right. Let's move on. Let's keep going. I'm going to keep going down the elevation and see if we can find even more mushroom th mushrooms there. All right. Follow me. I found how to find elevation. Just go to the compass on your uh, iPhone. I don't know if you have an Android where it would be. Uh, probably you have it too. Uh, and go to the compass and right away, it's gonna give you your location and elevation. So it's awesome to be able to write that down because mushrooms grow in different elevations. All right, let's go. I just want to film what I've noticed right now. There is a different, a different, definite change in the forest floor. Look at this uh, floor being covered with needles mostly. A little bit higher up, it was more pine needles. And then as we go, we now are getting these leaves all around. I need to really identify what kind of trees these are, but look how quickly the floor changes. Here we have a mix, and this is just a couple of hundred uh, meters. And then here, where I'm going to pull over, this is already all covered in leaves, right? Do you see how different that is? Incredible, right? There is like a definite line in what kind of trees are uh, growing at a certain location. All right, we're going to come out, pick up that trash I saw, and then uh, check out the forest floor here. I'm sure this is going to be a little harder, right? Because it's covered in leaves, but uh, hopefully we can see something.
All right. All right, friends. While searching for mushrooms in this forest, I found something uh, beautiful. It's not a mushroom, but check out that tree. Oh, let's see if you can see how it grows. Do you see that? It's like, it, it, it's unreal, right? I wonder if that was a uh, leftover from a previous tree and now new trees growing from it in such a shape. Let's get closer and look. I've never seen anything like that. You see, I told you, nature is full of surprises. How gorgeous is that? Okay. Look at the, the shape of those branches. Oh my God. So those are branches. Check it out. Unbelievable, such a straight um, tree trunk and then such interesting looking branches. Wow. But as far as mushrooms, no luck so far here. Did find this peak though. I wonder who it belongs to. I actually have, I think, oh no, I don't have a poop guide, but um, this might be a rabbit or a deer, but it's a lot. Whoa, look at that. Pretty cool. I pulled up uh, this image from Google and I'm certain that our poop is deer poop, not the rabbit poop, because it's a little bit more elongated in shape. Right, another find, some sort of mold. Not sure what it is, but I will definitely check uh, with the part in the book about slime molds, I would assume. It's stuck to this moss. Oh, look at it. So I stopped by this tree to pick up this trash. There is just so much glass and plastic right around this one tree. It's not easy to pick it all up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it all, but I'm doing my best. Now, as I stopped, I found this mushroom growing on the tree and uh, might be dying because look at the bark. Hmm but I believe this is a turkey tail mushroom or um, something in that family. We're going to look at the picture a little bit later too from the book. Oh, look, something else. I found this guy here growing out of the ground. This looks like this one flower that I used to pick with my grandpa back in Belarus when I was little. We would go to the forest. One more thing that I found while picking up these tiny pieces. Uh, just so much, just so much. Sometimes it's hard to know where to begin. Kids, please do not pick up glass by yourself. Let your parents do it for you, please. Just point it to me. Now, as I found out, look what I found. I think this is also slime mold. Oh, more turkey tails. Hi. Hi friends. And then those little orange ones. Look, I believe that's also a type of slime mold. Amazing. Hi friends. So I am, I'm having a little bit of luck. I found uh, this patch of the forest that is uh, uh, filled with pine trees. And also it has a little slope like this. And from watching Yellow Eleanor, I know that uh, 
pine mushrooms like to hide inside slopey areas inside like that uh, now i have not found any mushrooms there but as i was walking towards those little trees let's see if you can see there are the tiny little mushrooms right there little white spot uh hiding there and let's go and take a look at them a little bit closer i also got my uh, mushroom guidebook for now i'm doing very simple identification just going through the pictures and then later on i'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into each mushroom let's see what kind of mushroom this is hi guys there they are oh my goodness oh my goodness look at that shape <laughs> oh wow it's three of them. One, and then two, and three. Hi, beauties. And then there was one more thing that I found here. And I think it's very important because anytime I see slugs, I, I find mushrooms. And I found that little guy right there. And we're going to go and ask him for permission to look for mushrooms here. Uh, it usually works for me. I feel like they're the protectors of the magical realm. All we gotta do is ask. All right, before we begin identifying this mushroom, I'm gonna come along closer to him. And make sure that I am not stepping on anything important because to him, I'm a giant. Hi, dear. I did not mean to disturb you. Hi. But I just wanted to ask you for permission to look for mushrooms in your forest. I know you love mushrooms and you like to eat them, but I would love to study them and hopefully one day share my love for the forest with others, encouraging them to keep the forests clean. Um, well, thank you in advance. Thank you for listening. You are so beautiful. Enjoy your day. Besides the mushrooms, I just want to say how much I love pine forests. Look how soft it is here. <sighs> I'm on a slope, so I'm kind of moving down, but it's just heaven on earth. Look at this baby tree covered in uh, pine needles and they hang as if they're earrings. <laughs> Imagine if trees have uh, style and it's stylish to be wearing pine needles like jewelry. Isn't that awesome? This one too. So in my book, I went uh, to the pictures of uh, small, fragile, small, fragile, gilled mushrooms. And out of all the pictures, I have found that this one looks the most like it by the shape of the cap and how thin the stem is. So this is the mushroom in the book that looks the most like this mushroom right wouldn't you agree right there maybe not but the shape looks just exactly the same everything else kind of looks a little bit different right all right, so let's just explore a little bit further. Let's dive deeper into uh, this uh, number 43 mushroom, Sfa Gnum Bog Galeri Galerina. Ooh, Galerina, I think those are like deadly mushrooms. Ooh, good thing I didn't pick it up. Well, not that I, if I pick it up, I would get sick from it. You would have to 
it would have to get into your digestive system uh, to get you sick. So you can touch a mushroom that is uh, bad and be okay. Just wash your hands, of course. All right, so let's go Spagnum Bog Galerina. Let's see, 43 page. It sends us to page uh, 60, 621. Page 621, 622, and there we go. Spagnum Bog Galerina. Tall, slender, stocked, tawny brownish, yes, tawny brownish um, mushroom in sphagnum bogs. Tawny. Tawny. Of an orange brown or yellowish brown color. Cap. 3 eighths to 1 and 3 eighths of an inch or 1 to 3.5 centimeters wide, conical, becoming somewhat knobbed, yes, yes, margin is curved at first, radially lined, moist, smooth, tawny or tawny, fading to ochre, then ochre buff, I don't know what that means, I will look it up, ochre, Ochre. Ochre, iron ochre, or ochre in American English is a natural clay earth pigment, a mixture of ferric oxide and varying amounts of clay and sand. It ranges in color from yellow to deep orange or brown. It is also the name of the colors produced by this pigment, especially a light brownish yellow. Gills attached, close to nearly distant narrow to moderately broad, tawny to ochre. Ochre is probably the color. Now, let's see, is that it for our 621? Yes, it continues here. Stock, two to eight inches long and one sixteenth to one eighth thick. Very long and thin, fragile, hollow, towny to pale buff. Spores 8.5 to 14 by 5 by 7. E, I don't know that symbol. Elliptical, roughened with smooth, pool like depression. Spore print rust. Season May to November, abundant in. Sphagnum bogs. Bog. Muddy ground, too soft to support a heavy body. Bog. Sphagnum. 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 Any of a large genus of mosses that usually grow in wet areas, as bogs, and become compacted with other plant matter to form peat. Or a mass of sphagnum plants. I pulled up some Google images for you here and another description popped up. Sphagnum is a genus of approximately 380 accepted species of mosses, commonly known as sphagnum moss, also bog moss and Quaker moss. Looking at our pictures, I don't think that our mushrooms are surrounded by sphagnum or moss, um, but Sphagnum might be underneath the pine needles and this certainly might be uh, a bog. Remember I told you there is a very steep slope to the left of me. So this is a very low area and um, all of the snow is coming into this area when it melts. So I am sure it stays very wet for a very long time and might be considered a bog. Range north north america south in bogs this is one of many similar moss inhabiting gallerinas little is known about the edibility of most gallerinas these mushrooms are usually found growing in bogs and are thought to be more most abundant in dry years when other mushrooms are sparse all right 
Oh, and then deadly long gallerina is 39. Let's see how it looks. How the deadly long gallerina looks. 39. Let's find it. Let's find it in the book just so we know. 39. Deadly gallerina. Oh, looks like this. Wait. Let me get off the ground. Looks like this. So this is definitely not that one, but it's definitely a little brown mushroom. So <laughs> we're not gonna experiment with this one, but I'll take a closer look underneath the gills, closer to the gills to see if you can possibly identify more of it without picking it up. sum up, I would say that because so much information from the description in the book on Sphagnum bog gallerina conflicts that of our mushroom, that we do not have a positive ID. And of course, we would have to unearth our mushroom completely and do a spore print to identify it properly. Yet this was certainly a cool starting point and we are one step closer to understanding how the process of identification works. Lots and lots of more little brown mushrooms in this little forest. Well, it's, it's a big forest, <laughs> but in this patch where there are a bunch of uh, baby trees, baby firs, I believe, and um, a mix of baby firs and uh, large pines. I wonder how that happens. Why does a like a, a, a forest that is full of pine trees gives birth to little fir? Or maybe I'm confusing something. Maybe a pine tree when a baby looks like this? Hmm. I doubt it. I just came across a family of deer eating or grazing. Look at them. Oh. All right, so no luck so far with finding pine mushrooms or um, other mushrooms even, just uh, those two kinds that I found and I'm getting super duper hungry and I'm going to go uh, and eat and then we're going to stop by an animal shelter and look at some cats. So uh, tune in for that. Alex. Видишь телефоне другой код? Это ты. Это ты там. Ты такой умный. Ты видишь, да? Кто там? Хороший код. Хороший код. My friends, tune in to check in later videos if Alex became a part of my family. Hi friends, so um, I know that I have been um, not going deep into the forest uh, and that probably has something to do with me finding mushrooms or not. 
Now, I don't go far uh, in because I don't know how to re read um, the map and compass yet. And this is exactly what I came here for into uh, this semi-foresty area, right? Something very simple and open. Um, I came here to practice those skills. So I have a compass and I have this wonderful book, um, Wilderness Navigation, Finding Your Way Using Map Compass, uh, Altimeter and GPS. Um, third edition by Bob Burns and Mike Burns. Now, uh, there's more complex ways to uh, find your location um, and use a map, but today I'm just going to do the basic, the most basic way of finding my way from point A to point B and back, right? So let's say I want to uh, go deep down towards a certain tree and then come right back. How would I do it? Now, we're gonna read in the book together. Bearings in the field. All bearings in the field are based on where the magnetic needle points. For the sake of simplicity, we will first ignore this, uh, the effects of magnetic declination. Yes, I actually know about magnetic declination and I will uh, explain it to you later. A subject that will be taken up in the next section. Let us imagine that we are in central Missouri where the declination is negligible. To, make, uh, to take measure a bearing in the field, hold the compass in front of you and point the direction of travel line at the object or whose bearing you want to find. So I will point the direction of travel line at the tree rotate the compass housing or bezel until the pointed end of the orienting arrow is aligned with the north seeking usually red end of the magnetic needle this process is sometimes referred to as boxing the needle or getting the dog in the dog house red in the shed i've heard something like that too read the bearings uh, at the index line, see figure 10. So figure 10, index line is going to be our bearing. So here I have my compass. I'm going to align the tree and bring it right into this little spot right here. You see that little triangular spot? So I'm gonna find my tree, the one that I want to walk to, in that triangular spot I did. And now I'm gonna place the red in the shed. The red in the shed. The red in the shed. Let's place the red in the shed. I'm going to use my mirror to help me with that. And I think I got it in. All right, guys, so after uh, placing my tree, the one that I want to walk to, right here and uh, putting the red in the shed right there, I have got my uh, number. I have to go uh, 110 degrees southeast. Oh, the closer the phone gets to the uh, by the way, look, the closer the phone gets to the compass, the more it affects the compass. Look, you see, because phone has a magnet in it. Uh-huh. So, 110 degrees southeast. And what would be the return? The return would be right here in the bottom. The return reading would be 290 Northwest. I'm going to write this down to make sure I don't forget as I'm going there. Let's see. I'm going to go 110 degrees southeast and then return uh, a 20, 290 degrees northwest. Okay. Now, that part of the compass that I keep referring to as the triangle through which I look uh, through and align my object with. Um, that is called 
、um, citing notch, peep sight, or simply sight. And、uh, in this picture, I named most of the parts that I used today for the compass. So we have that triangle where I put my tree in into, and、um, that's called sight. Then we have the mirror positioning line. We have magnetized needle, orienting arrow, bezel, the part that rotates, direction of travel arrow. The direction of travel travel arrow is also aligned with our return bearing. And guess what? The first thing on my path, I find mushrooms. Trying to get to that tree.、Woo. They are、uh, a little bit older. Let's see for this young one that's still in the ground. Can we wiggle him out? Hi, buddy. Hi. Hi, gorgeous. Oh, I didn't get him with everything, with the root, but、uh, maybe I can still identify him. Does he look like the other one? A little bit. All right. So I made it to my tree, and、uh, now I want to continue going forward. So I、uh, put another tree, that one,、uh, the third one from me,、uh, into my compass,、uh, right in between、uh, that little hole right here, and then I put the red in the shed. And、uh, made sure my compass is aligned with this line in the mirror. And the reading that it gave me is this: it told me that I have to go 90. Oops. Well, I can't. Yeah, it has to be like this. It、uh, told me that I have to go 90 degrees east. And I'm going to write down all of this information. Type it into my phone. First bearing 110 southeast. Return two hundred and ninety northwest. Second bearing ninety degrees east. Return two hundred and seventy degrees west. As I am walking towards my tree, I am constantly checking in with my compass. Am I walking in the right direction? I'm putting the red in the shed, and I'm heading. Uh, into the direction of my bearing, which is 90 degree east, which is now straight ahead. Okay, let's go. And I got to my tree. Perfect. Now let's take our third bearing, and, and this time I want to go to one of those furthest trees. Let's say one, two, the furthest one on the left. Let's see what I can do with my compass here. And surprisingly, I'm getting a very similar reading,、uh, which is 89, just one degree off to the left, 89、uh, degrees east. So let's go ahead and、uh, write that bearing down, and also write down the return bearing, which is exactly the opposite of 89, and that would be two. 70269. Okay, 269. Typing it in. Third bearing. 89 degrees east. Return bearing. 269 degrees west. And we almost made it to our tree. Following the compass, following our bearing. Let's now get to the tree. And then turn around and try to get back to the car, reading our return bearings. Right? We're gonna have to refer to our notes, which are best done not on the phone, but because I'm doing such a baby step, and my car is literally、uh, behind me. I can see it,、uh, and that means I have charger for my phone in the car. But in general, you want to write. You would want to write it down in a notebook. So, ooh, 
Surprisingly, I don't see my car. Oh my God, we're lost. Now, we need the compass. Let's first return uh, to our destination. You see how the air flipped as soon as it turned around 180 degrees? So now we're going to have to uh, place the red in the shed again. Uh, let's do it. I, unfortunately, I can't film and do it. So I'm going to do it and then show you and we're gonna use our return bearings uh, to get back to the car. So looking at the return bearings, we have to make sure that we go from the bottom back to the top. My first return bearing is 269 degrees west. Okay, 269 west. is going to lead us right there. Let's see if we can find something inside uh, that will, like a point to which we're gonna be walking to. All right, 269 gives us uh, that tree right there, this guy right here. So I'm gonna look at it and keep walking toward it. Guys, I, I'm beginning to understand how this works, so, now that I got my return bearing, right? So I turned around and I don't know where, what am I returning to? Which point, which tree? You know what I needed to do? I needed to count my steps so that I know that I need to walk this many steps uh, to return uh, in, uh, at, let's say 269 degrees west a uh, hundred steps, right? If it was a hundred steps to 90 degrees east or 89 degrees east, then it should be 90 steps uh, to a uh, hundred uh, to the opposite, right? In the opposite direction. Because if I just walk, then I don't know if I, I can be walking, uh, you know, 269 degrees west, God knows for how long, right? And I'm not gonna end up at my car. So the distance has to be the same. Ta-da! You see? I love doing this in the field because now I'm understanding. Otherwise, all that information in the book, I can't get it. All right, so next time we're gonna do it with steps. For now, I'm just gonna get back to the car because I'm getting a little cold. And then we're gonna repeat. We're gonna scratch. Well, not scratch. We're learning from our mistakes, right? Now, let's get back to the car, warm up and do it again. All right, I warmed up a little um, and I'm ready to do this again. And this time I'm going to count my steps or paces, I believe that's called uh, correctly. All right, I'm going to go right to that tree. So I'll take a bearing on my compass right now. And my reading is, um, hold on, it's 220 oh no let's be very accurate 210 and 212 214 216 218 degrees southwest and my return bearing is well it says 39 degrees uh northeast i'm gonna write it down recording my bearings first bearing 218 degrees southwest return 39 degrees northeast paces or steps we'll figure those out right now 41 42 43 44 45 46 47 48 49 50 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60. We're here and it's 131 steps. Let's see. So the starting point was my car and the bearing for that should be the return bearing. It's still saved on the compass because it's the first one. It's 39 degrees northeast. So we now need to place 
uh, the red in the shed again, and then count 131 steps back uh, in the direction of 39 degrees northeast. And hopefully that'll bring us back to my car. Let's give it a try. And let's write down the paces. 131 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 23 steps let's check in with our destination red in the shed 39 degrees northeast would be right over there let's see what's over there oh my car 71 72 70, 99, 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Oh my God, this worked perfectly, you guys. All right, this was just one bearing back and forth, but I think I'm finally understanding how it works. Ah, I'm so excited to do more and to learn more. I hope you understand now too. We're gonna practice together. We can do it anywhere, not in, not in the forest, anywhere we want. All right. I am so happy that I'm finally beginning to understand how to read the compass and how to use it. Because I got it and I got the book and I'm reading and I don't understand. And I was trying to find somebody who can help me. I found this one guy in REI who works there, but he said he used to do it. He knows how to do it really well, but he uh, can't do it. He doesn't do private classes. And as much as I asked him, he said no. So I uh, ended up doing it all by myself and I'm having a lot of fun. I really am uh, so proud of myself for uh, trying uh, to just dive into something that I wanted to learn and going for it and doing and uh, this feeling uh, <laughs> I highly recommend that you do um, the same thing whatever it is you want to do you don't know where to start begin somewhere just start taking whatever steps let them be mistake mistakes right but you're going to start moving in that direction and that's all you need to do all right i will see you soon bye hi guys i uh, stopped by my uh, children's favorite store the crystal shop and i want to show you around a little bit there are so many fun cool things here um maybe it'll inspire you whenever you don't know <laughs> what else you want in this life you'll be like them check out these beautiful candles with uh, crystals or salts i wonder what's inside earth's elements pine aromatic candle pine oh, i love the smell of pine clove and sandalwood let's give it a shot oh, that smells really good what else have evil eye candle hmm. magnolia and tuberose with black obsidian and clear quartz oh so they have crystal right inside the candle mmm this smells so good then we have love love crystal candle setter lavender and rose quartz heart let's see hmm it doesn't smell like much so far, my favorite by the scent is this one. Although normally I would prefer, prefer pine. Mmm, this candle. Ooh, I don't particularly like this. Moroccan amber with tiger's eye heart and fluoride. Fluoride is the stone. Calming paradise, crystal candle. Coconut vanilla with opalite heart and aquamarine. Let's see. Uh, there's some oh maybe it's the coconut that I'm not that fond of and then this one is joy and abundance <laughs> breezy muget and sea salt with chameleon heart and green jade let's smell this one 
Ooh. Still my favorite is this one. And let's see for the divine light. Jasmine with amethyst tart and clear quartz. Mmm, I like the way this smells and it looks so beautiful. Gorgeous. So Earth's Elements Wellness Candles. Really cool. What else? They have a full wall of incense right there. Mm -hmm. And then um, all sorts of things where you can burn your incense and then incense cones. Look how beautiful everything is. My kids spend hours here. <laughs> Look at this store, it has everything. My oldest son is into uh, perfumes and creating his own scents. So here he can stay for a long time just smelling different things and learning and experimenting. And then there is the stand with all sorts of herbs that you can steep and make them like tea. And there are little teapots here. These are so awesome where you can steep your herbs. Look, you open it up and it has tiny holes like that and it's a cup. So right away you can take this one out after and have your drink. Isn't this amazing and super convenient? And beautiful. Very pretty. And let's see what type of things they have. Alfalfa leaf and it says detoxification of the liver and urinary tracts has eight amino acids to help flush out toxins. Due to its oestrogenic action, it is useful in treating problems associated with menstruation and the menopause, increases energy and reduces fatigue. Anise whole star, bilberry leaf, uh, anise seed bird's eye. What is that? I always wondered, what's the anise seed bird's eye for? Native Americans use it in ceremonial smoke mixes. The essential oil is used to flavor candy. It can uh, relieve asthma, make coughing more productive, treat indigestion, and reduce nausea and gas. Its sweet taste makes it a great remedy for children's complaints, not for use during pregnancy. And here there are some actual tea blends. I love tea blends that are herbal, just like that, because I don't do caffeine at all. Elderberries and flowers, lemon balm, lemon verbena, lemon peel, hibiscus, and spearmint. Looks really good. Mm. What else? And then they have, oh, they have something like this. Heart of the Earth, 100% pure ceremonial cacao. That's cool. Did you know chocolate started as a cacao drink? Very cool. How to prepare cacao from a block. Use a chef's knife and a cutting board to chop cacao pieces to no larger than half an inch or on any side. Measure one fourth cup of chopped cacao. Add natural sweetener and hold on. Add natural sweetener and or spices to taste. We recommend coconut sugar and cinnamon to start. Heat water to steaming, but not boiling, with a precision kettle, 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Measure one cup of hot water. Mix cacao, hot water, and flavorings in a soft, leaded blender, or use a handheld frother, both better than stirring. Pour into your favorite mug and enjoy with deep breaths. That's awesome. I should get this for my kids. Non-GMO, grown in on family farms in Guatemala, sourced through ethical direct trade with Mayan collectives who roast the cacao seeds, aka beans, over wood fire and peel by hand. High in polyphenol antioxidants, minerals, and theobromine, energizing without the crash of cravings. Minimally processed, 
It still contains the healthy cacao butter, unlike cocoa or cacao powder. Produced without child labor or modern slavery, both are common in the chocolate industry. Wow, that's awesome. Maybe I'll try this with, for my kids, for sure. I'm gonna get this. Instead of hot cocoa, this is what we're gonna try. And here are all the crystals. Wow, you can spend days in here reading about. This is onyx, my birthstone. <laughs> onyx, inner strength, discipline, focused attention, reason. Third eye, solar plexus, and root. I am focused and disciplined. I achieve all of my tasks with high efficiency and perseverance. It's beautiful that they created this. There's green onyx, I never knew that. Green onyx, soothing, compassion, unity of heart and will, heart chakra. So each one of these crystals has a certain vibration. There is pyrite. I used to have a heart like this with the pyrite. And there are many, many more. Epidote looks beautiful. And this is probably my favorite section. It has um, books over there. And then it has all kinds of simple guides here. Like this aromatherapy guide, for example. Right? It tells you using essential oils, aromatherapy, top 30 aromatherapy garden, 100 oil review. Stefan Magler. And it gives you, let's say, uh, basil extraction method blends well with bergamot, ginger, lavender, and uses helpful for easing headaches and migraines. And it gives you a description of every herb and essential oil. Isn't this awesome? When somebody does uh, something like this and puts everything into a guide, a simple guide, makes it so much easier to understand and wrap your head around it. There's palm mystery guide, yoga guide. This one, it looks fun. Let's see, yoga guide. Oh, and gives you all the postures. Tree posture, tree posture two. Arm stretch, squat stretch, right angle stretch, lotus position and so on and so forth. This is really cool. And yoga paraphernalia, about yoga. This would be a fun one to read. And it's not a book, so you kind of, you can read it fairly quick and get all the main points about a certain subject. So I highly recommend whenever you are in a store like this, or this particular store, to stop by this section and maybe pick up a new interest or skill. Gluten-free guide, detox guide, alternative medicine guide. There's one that I wanted to get, but I can't find it right now. I wonder if it got sold. Um, raw food vitamins at a glance no i wanted to get a guide that showed oh chinese face reading alternative medicine does not belong here chinese face reading that's interesting easy herb growing no homeopathy no i wanted to get a guide about food and vitamins found it it's the 120 healthiest foods and look it gives you food and then t 
tells you which nutrients it contains and how many. Super useful. I'm gonna get this one. Hi everyone. So it kept on raining, uh, kind of started pouring and I got a little cold and wet and I thought, you know what, nothing better than uh, take uh, a hotel, hotel room for this night so that I can warm up, catch up with putting the videos together and also take a shower. So <laughs> tonight is going to be in a hotel, which is actually one of my favorite places to stay. Uh, it's very simple, but it has everything that uh, you, one can need. So I'm going to show you around here um, in just a bit. Uh, and also, yes, it has a communal building with communal kitchen. So I bought some uh, split pea soup it's in the store uh, and I'm going to go warm it up and you're going to come with me. Let's go. And surprise, uh, I'm having again uh, a detour. Uh, the second I said, okay, I'm gonna go to the uh, kitchen and make myself uh, the soup, warm it up on the stove instead of a microwave, that's how I like it. Especially when you have the kitchen, you know, it's a um, luxury, why, why not use it, right? It's such a useful thing. Uh, so I went up there and uh, there was uh, a family occupying the communal kitchen and they're taking up the stove. They're cooking dinner for their kids. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, went, I walked in with the soup and I turned around and left to give them time to prepare dinner. And then I'm gonna step in. And um, as I was walking back, I was thinking, hey, how uh, does it happen to you that the second you say something that, oh, I'm gonna do this, and you go ahead to do it and then life just detours you, right? I think it happens to me a lot and um, I have learned to be uh, very flexible with that and um, also uh, the more I, uh, the more time I spend in the communal buildings, right? Just something like this hotel that has a lot of um, communal spaces or uh, the new uh, place where I moved to where I live it has a lot of communal places it's like a, um, a complex with a lot of apartments and uh, we all share a communal pool and uh, um, communal gym and uh, all sorts of communal spaces there so uh, I've learned that uh, detours. The, the more people are around you, the more you're going to detour. And you know what? It's totally cool because uh, it's just the way it goes, right? When it's just you, you can absolutely, you know, focus on one thing and achieve it. But when it's, uh, let's say, me and all of my children around me, whatever I plan, uh, probably it's not gonna go the way I envisioned it. 100% <laughs> it's not gonna go the way I've verbalized it and envisioned it. So I've learned to take life as it comes and I wanted to um, take this moment and ask you, uh, do you, can you achieve things that you've planned? Do things usually go according to plan for you? Or uh, do you get these uh, cool divine detours uh, and how do you react? So that's a bunch of questions in one. Please comment, let me know, share with me. I would love, love, love to know how your life is going by. Thanks. Let's wait for that kitchen. We'll be back there soon. It's free now. So we're gonna cook. Oh, just warm up the soup basically, but there we go. Thank you. 
This is all for our second day in Shasta. I am happy to finally dedicate time to learning things that I have always wanted to. It's beginning to make sense and take some sort of shape. And I can't wait to practice more. Please share what type of things have you finally made time for. I would love to know. All right.